I don't know where I did that. Good morning, everybody. It's Christine Merriman, a trauma expert with Speak Up and Empower's Real Talks. I love being a part of Speak Up and Empower because they host hundreds, if not thousands of people <clears throat> who are trying to change the world for the better. Today, my guest is a native and I, I love I love my native cultures. I am 1% native and I tell everybody it's right in the middle of my heart. But let me just first tell, mention that I have a little free ebook available to you. It's called Overcoming Negative Self-Talk. It's available at bit.ly forward slash negative self-talk ebook. That's bit dot L-Y forward slash negative self-talk ebook. So welcome, James. Would you mind giving us your, your um, greeting in, in your native language? Aho. Bonjour. Bonjour in the way market. Morning. How do you go in Make an ock and do them. Make an ock watch a wing and do them. You know, gives you got no gum. And that is the traditional protocol greeting. Yes. Uh, I said hello, all of my relatives. My name is Kage Gabo. I'm also James Vukulich. I'm Turtle Clan. I'm a descendant of Turtle Mountain. And I live close to Minneapolis today. And I said it's a good day. It is indeed a good day. What is the origin of your last name, Vukulich? That's Croatian. Wow. Yes, my dad is Croatian. In fact, I am the first one in his line to be <laughs> not 100% uh, Croatian and Slovenian. Wow. I love those people. I've, I've known people from all around the world. I was an exchange student to Istanbul at age 16. And I think that just has always made me have an eye on the globe. And um, I know many people in the in those, what do they call them? I don't the recall. Vulcans? Yeah, the Vulcans. Yes. It's really wonderful. You know, the Vulcans established Venice. Ah, yeah. Yeah, I love that story. They are quick to point that out. <laughs> well, it makes sense because they had so many wars and they had such bad climate that they wanted to do something in a warmer place. And so they found these quasi little islands and they built them. They, the reason they, the, they built them by sinking into the ground underneath every building in Venice, trees, full wow. pine trees. So there may be a million pine trees underneath Venice to support all of those buildings. Isn't that I interesting? No yeah. Yeah. A fascinating city. I'd love to visit sometime. Well, I'd like you to give us a little bit of your background so that people can get to know you for who you really are, like, like you know, your family life. Um, well, right now, my name is, again, Kage Gobble. It's my mm -hmm. Ojibwe name. Mm -hmm. uh, Ojibwe Anishinaabe. For those of you who are not familiar with those terms, it's also Chippewa. Mm -hmm. of the treaty signed with the United States government are, are listed as uh, with the Chippewa. Mm. Uh, Where's the Anishinaabe come from? Anishinaabe is the autonym, endonym. It's the name that we have for ourselves, huh. as well as Ojibwe. And then, is Ojibwe yeah, a nation? Is they it are. A Both a nation, a nation and a language. And a uh, language. So Ojibwe would also, you know, in translation into English, it can be the people, but it can also be the language that's spoken. Oh. Which is an important, incredibly important part of determining who the people are. Yes, uh, of course it is. How you communicate, how you think, how how you relate to the world. And Ojibwe has not got an A at the end. It has an E at the end. That surprised me. I, I don't think I've ever noticed it being an E. But it, it makes... is, I think, a throwback from writing before a standardized writing system in American mm -hmm. English, mm -hmm. where that A sound mm -hmm. in some cases would be Ojibwa, mm -hmm. and then in other cases would be Ojibwe. Oh, interesting. So people who uh, may not be familiar with that, in the 1820s, in maybe even uh, the turn of the 19th century, may have written it one way or the other. Yeah. In fact, uh, Chippewa, it's a... Uh, it's really a mispronunciation of Ojibwe. It's trying to say Ojibwe in English. Mm -hmm, I know. Uh, that way sound doesn't really show up anywhere. Yeah. In the language in the English language. So it be there is an epithetical I sound. Chippewa. Mm -hmm. Oh Chippewa. Mm -hmm. Shortened to Chippewa. 
And then mm -hmm. that A sound, if you look at it, will become Chippewa. Yeah. Yeah. So were you raised in Minneapolis or were you raised on a reservation or I what? Not. I was raised in North Central Minnesota. Uh -huh. uh, again, my dad is Croatian, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the former Yugoslavia. He came from mining country in northern Minnesota. So mm -hmm. his mother came from uh, Eveleth and Monaga in northern Minnesota. And from there, they moved to the Cuyuna Iron Range in Crosby in Ironton, Minnesota. And it's very cold up there. It is. It is Some indeed. Temperatures, because <laughs> I think everybody will be amused. <laughs> it is indeed. Um, and so that's, I grew up in uh, northern Minnesota, mostly yeah. in, a, in a town in north central Minnesota called Brainerd. Uh -huh. I've heard of Brainerd. Isn't there skiing up there? Uh a little further north, but there is a, a little resort called Skeagol, I believe. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, it's very resort driven in the summer. Mm -hmm. it, it is the land of 10,000 lakes. So there's a, a number of people who travel from the Twin Cities to to get out of town, to take in the great north woods and uh, yeah, all of the beauty it has to offer. I just want to make a comment about my younger brother. My younger brother, Doug Merriman, is a great uh, fan of the Native Americans and he's he always went up to Ely, Minnesota, went from being, I think, nine or 10 years old to canoe with these boys at Camp Voyager. And he became, then later on, he became a dishwasher and then he eventually became a guide. And then in, oh, I don't know, it was the early 80s, I think, he canoed the uncharted waters of the Yukon Territory. But ever since then, he's, he's made many, many friends among the Canadian First Nation, which is what they call their natives. And so this is why... Also, I met George Morrison, who was a great American artist who left his reservation. He came from up in your country. I don't know exactly where he came from. Chionigamink, the Grand Portage Reservation, I believe. Ah, and he just left it and went to New York City to become an artist. But because he was Native, he couldn't really make his reputation here. He got, developed his reputation actually more in Europe. But then he returned to the University of Minnesota, where I met him in 1971, and at that time, Wounded Knee was happening. George actually introduced me to Dennis Banks and Russell Means. Did I get that right? Or is it Russell? Yeah. And um, at, at one of their powwows. And that was my first powwow. It was at a big convention center downtown. But boy, you could feel it and hear it as you came like within a mile of the building. And it was, it just, it didn't overwhelm me. It just, it just so moved every single atom in me, the, the sound of the drums, which I know that every native uh, indigenous person, uh, culture has had. So uh, that's another thing I like about Speak Up and Empower is they have a world drum day, which you go all around the globe listening to drums. I love that. So it goes up on every continent. Yeah, yeah. So when you... You, you went to college. Did you go, did you know that you wanted to become a, a linguist? Did you know that you wanted to reorient? Did, have you had any difficulty being oriented to your native culture? Uh, well, when I went to college, I had quite a storied and checkered past with uh, <laughs> my studies because there were a number of changes. Yeah. I originally went to school to study film and video. Uh, uh, I was too. fortunate enough where I grew up and where I went to high school to have a television studio in the high school. It's where they had the oh, uh, wonderful. Uh, public access station. Yeah. And so I got to take TV productions. I learned how to work with film, with, with video. Uh, it was 1992. Green screen was just being introduced. Yeah. So yeah. I, I wanted to go into school with that because I was fascinated by it. I was fascinated by editing. I was fascinated by the art of cinema. Um, and where were you at school? In, in uh, my first school was Minneapolis Community College. Yeah, it was MCC. Idea. They have a great mm -hmm. uh, film and video program. But when I got there, I, when you learn the nuts and bolts of it, and it's, uh, you have to, I think you have to be all in, in that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really, Absolutely. I was not willing to make that commitment mm. uh, for it. it. It was important to not, to realize that my passion wasn't there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
And as I was writing and I was developing, uh, you know, you develop scripts, you, you take screenwriting, I, I got into literature. So I went into English literature. And then from there, I, I got into French. Um, so you did say bonjour to me this morning. I said bonjour, and sometimes it's mistaken. Uh, from bonjour and bonjour, they sound very similar, don't they? Is bonjour the other one? Is that a native term? Bonjour is the Ojibwe. Bonjour. Bonjour and bonjour is uh, the French. That's nice. nice. But so when I began studying French, French literature in particular, it was absolutely fascinating, and I, I've always tried to follow my passion. And I thought, well, I can take courses here at the university or in college, or I could literally move, move somewhere where they speak French all the time and do complete immersion. And that was my goal, uh, was to become fluent in French. And so I did. That's what I did. I picked up. I went into an immersion program at the University de Quebec of Trois-Rivières, the University of Quebec in Three Rivers, mm -hmm. uh, a town that is... Right in between Montreal and Quebec City. In Canada. Side. In Canada, in mm -hmm. Quebec, Canada. And I, I, yeah, I moved there. And I, I had a chance to learn some things there that I would carry over in linguistics, like phonetics. Uh, mm -hmm. I would most importantly learn how to learn a language. Mm -hmm. uh, that first language, there can be so many hangups mm -hmm. in the way that you think mm -hmm. that you know, one example I like to share with people is uh, in English, I am hungry. Now, in French, it would be like, I have hunger. Mm -hmm. uh, and for so many people, they just cannot make that shift. Like, I know I'm not. Mm -hmm. I do not have hunger. I am hungry. And so kind of learning that, that there are different ways of approaching the language. And then they have, they have um, pronouns for things. Like you know, female things and Masculine, male elements. Feminine. And in some cultures, it's hungry. I am, or it's hunger is with me. Or my Absolutely. brother was a linguist too. Okay. My brother. Yes. So I know quite a lot about what he went through in his life. So, so I great. enjoyed that. After a year, yeah. I I also wanted to see what a, a cultural revolution looked like. Yeah. There had been a vote there to uh, secede from Canada, which in was Quebec, mainly yes. based on uh, the language and the culture. And, uh, you know, it's it was a peaceful movement. It, it still is. And I wanted to see that what that looked like mm -hmm. rather than reading about it in the United States, but actually actually being there. Mm -hmm. That really shifted my perspective on a lot of things when I came back to the United States. Mm -hmm. I went back to school. I had every intention of becoming a French teacher. I had moved to another country. I had learned a, another language. It, it took me nine months. I would have preferred to do a full year, but, uh, you know, the school year is nine months. Yeah. Uh, and when I got back, I, I did some work with French. I, I went to the University of Minnesota and continued my French uh, studies. But I also had to take a course when I went back to City College mm -hmm. to uh, get my full financial aid package. Mm -hmm. And so I saw Ojibwe was being offered. Ooh. And this was my mm -hmm. first ever introduction to the Ojibwe language, to the culture. Wow. I had not heard about it until I was already at this point a 25-year-old man. Wow. 24, 25. Boy, I salute the work you've done. You know, I mean, it's it. You you speak so fluently. You, you every day you give a word of the day. Every week you give a talk about your culture and its ways. And I think it's just because of your, you have a great passion for this. You know, it was it. Uh, <laughs> everything kind of had been leading up to there. Mm -hmm. uh, I had learned again how to learn a language. So all of these mm -hmm. things that may trip people up in Ojibwe, I was kind of familiar with, like gender, for example. If you look at gender uh, from a Latin perspective, it just means like a like a box that something fits in. <laughs> so it can be masculine or feminine, usually uh -huh. in Indo-European languages. In Algonquian languages, 
it's animate or inanimate. Oh, wow. So it is an it or a he or a she. Uh -huh. Now, for some things in English, like rocks, yeah. trees, mm -hmm. uh, water, drums, feathers, those are its. In mm -hmm. the Ojibwe language, these are he or she. These are animate beings. So for me, I was like, all right, well, then I have to use a certain verb to talk about these, to describe these, mm -hmm. to, uh, to relate to them. Uh, and I was really grateful for my French studies that kind of prepared me for mm -hmm. conjugating yeah. thousands yeah. and thousands of conjugations in the Ojibwe language, as well as figuring out some of these other beautifully unique qualities to the language. And mm -hmm. it was so fascinating that despite having studied film and video, that despite having studied literature in, in both French and English, uh, studying some linguistics while I was studying French, it kind of put me in a perfect position to uh, to go all in in Ojibwe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was another part that I was that I rarely have a chance to talk about. Maybe if I could take one moment and, and describe it here. When I came back from Quebec, I saw people who were very proud of their language, mm -hmm. very proud of their culture. Are I'm these native proud. people or just people in general? Québécois. Yeah, French yeah. and Canadians mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who had, uh, you know, of who their story along with the their arrival and settling of Mikanako Minasing of Turtle Island of North America, and they played mm -hmm. a huge role in that. And they were at such a point where they said, well, if we cannot celebrate this and teach this and have this a part of our life, then we'll leave this country. And when I came back, I thought, well, these are people who have come here to the United States, to Canada, and have such a, a pride in their background, in their culture, in their language, in their history. Shouldn't Native people, yeah. Indigenous people, not be afforded that right, but celebrate that inherent right that they have always had to have their language, to have their history, to have their culture? Uh, first and foremost in their nation. So that uh, that really inspired me in not just learning the language, but in trying to share the language with anyone who wanted to learn it. So in your whole background, you had no contact with Native? Was your mother Native? My mother is Native. Uh, my Yeah, my mother's whole side of the family. I know a lot of those generations didn't want to be Native, and they, they would often deny it. And, and if they looked white, they would, you know, they might definitely deny it but and there's a part oh, here that is so important to discuss and this is like when you mentioned russell means when you mentioned dennis banks when mm -hmm. you mentioned george morrison these were all people who like my mother mm -hmm. like my grandmother mm -hmm. went to boarding schools that's right so there was there was a reason i didn't have much exposure to yeah. the language, to the culture, to the history, to the spirituality. Because these were all people who went to total institutions. Yeah. It's a sociological term. It is a place where yeah. what you wear, the books you read, how you pray, the language you use, mm -hmm. when you go to sleep, the food you eat, go to the bathroom, the food mm -hmm. you eat are mm -hmm. all determined for you by another culture. Yeah. And their institution. Yeah. So it is uh, total institutions are used. That term is used to describe the military mm -hmm. and prisons as well. Mm -hmm. And this was compulsory. This was not my mom living at home. My, you right. live at the boarding school. That's right. The people who uh, your brother uh, have lived with, has learned from, those people also went through that experience. Mm -hmm. And it's an experience that both Canadian and uh, mm -hmm. Indigenous people from the United States went through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for me, we are to, still doing it today. So for me to hear about the language and the culture for the first time, it was really powerful. Yeah, I'll bet. and uh, you know, as I grew up, uh, and as I learned about it, I think some people may have felt some resentment about that. As I learned more about it, I felt empathy. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? This is these are two generations we're talking about. My mm -hmm. grandmother also went to a boarding school. Mm 
I think there were probably three, maybe even four generations uh, in the earliest, although they didn't necessarily have the institutions yet, but they were still doing the same things. And in the uh, so late 1880s, I believe, Carlisle right. will be created in the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So you could actually remove people from their homelands and put them in uh, yeah. this totally new environment mm -hmm. where they would not have contact yeah. with that. So, so because of that, that made that that inspired me to yeah. to share whatever I could learn mm -hmm. uh, with anyone who maybe had my similar experience. So your school had real native first. Not, uh, not you weren't in Canada anymore. You were back in Minneapolis, and they had. Did they have real? Uh, Ojibwe teachers? Absolutely. Well, I went to University of Minnesota. Uh, My school. I like that place. In And that school actually mm -hmm. has the oldest Indian studies, American Indian studies no. in the country. Here we have Dartmouth, which was established for the Native Americans. Indeed. But of course, today they are, you know, they're just such a minute population there. Indeed. And this was, a, but University of Minnesota created a, a, degree, a degree program where you could, and I think this is important, like mm -hmm. uh, study Native people. Yeah. Have a curriculum to learn about the people we live. I don't think they had, I was there in 1971, and I only stayed for about a year and a half. And I was into film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, they didn't have any program at the university, but we had five students who wanted to study it. And I was given the key to the door of a closet with an Oxbury animation machine in it, which was really lovely to work with. But I never, heard, George taught us um, native art, native. Yes, that was part of the yeah. program. But I didn't know that there was an entire program. Yes. Wow. In Indian studies department. So this is an incredibly oh, important yeah. uh, oracle. Yes. Place. And, and do they have many yeah. different tribes or nations, or I don't know how you divide them up, but do they have just Ojibwe, or are they many tribes? In Dakota as well. Uh -huh. We're the two uh, principal nations who live here in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. so they have both a Dakota language program as well as a, an Ojibwe program. So what is the difference between the Dakota and the Lakota? Linguist uh, and teacher for him uh, and a, a relative as well. These are different dialects of the same language. Oh. So the Dakota, Lakota, Nakota oh. uh, languages are related. They're mm -hmm. from the same language family. Mm -hmm. um, historically speaking, you could probably think that it was uh, one group that as they grew, developed different ways of speaking. Hmm. But the main difference in their dialects are uh, the D's and the L's. Hmm. Uh, for example, to say thank you or thanks in Dakota, it's Wopida. Now, my Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota is poor at best, so you'll have to forgive me. In Lakota, it would be Wopila. Mm -hmm. So instead of the D, there's an L. My brother talked, he lived in China for the last 10 years of his life, and uh, he talked a lot about things like that because there are so many dialects in China. Indeed. And then he went between Ch Ch uh, China and Japan, went back to China because Japan was too industrialized for him. He, he lived in Beijing until he was sent home, and then that summer the um, uprising where the, that tank was coming down that on Tiananmen Mall, Square. And that guy was standing in front of it. And then he was allowed, but he was allowed back in after that, that okay. summer. And he um, he also traveled around a lot in the Southeast Asian states. And he had spent a lot of time in Europe, all over Europe, from Norway to England to uh, Austria, down to the South. And um, so I've, I've been hearing stories like this my whole life. I, I really... Uh, I really like this. Did they did they talk about their experiences in the institutions much? Your teachers? Well, uh, indeed, it was a huge part of their lives. Yeah. I mean, I, if, I mean, uh, if you can imagine that you're not able to live at home. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
and that for so many of them had to learn their language again. Yeah. Uh, I know of one account where a, a person coming home couldn't really speak to his father because his father didn't know English. Mm -hmm. And having spent a number of yeah. years in yeah. the where you were literally, uh, and th these cases are being documented, uh, they're being recorded, where you would literally face uh, physical, mm -hmm. emotional, mm -hmm. often sexual abuse. Sexual yeah. abuse. Yeah. In these yeah. places, literal physical discipline for, you mm -hmm. know, for using the language. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you hear this story a lot. In fact, the protocol greeting I started with, mm -hmm. uh, that's probably a newer innovation mm. in the language and in the culture. Because I heard Russell Means, I think it was, I'm not sure whether it was Dennis or Russell, speaking to Congress in the 80s or something I, it wasn't it wasn't contemporary and it was sometime at the end of the last century and he gave the protocol greeting and i i was looking for hearing because i've listened to you so often on your on your weekly talk where you give your protocol greeting but i, I couldn't really uh get it if it was the same or different he is lakota so i I believe mm -hmm. he was speaking Lakota, mm -hmm. which would be, which is a, again, it's a different language family altogether. Mm -hmm. Would be like an English speaker listening to someone using Mandarin Chinese. Or even Scottish <laughs> or Welsh. I mean, Scottish and Welsh are in the same language family, though, as English. Yeah. yeah. This but is a totally it's, different it's, language. There's just nothing similar. I mean, it's very hard for us to understand anything that they're Indeed. Indeed. It's, it's even worse. I mean, it, for me, I, I moved to Baton Rouge, Louisiana for a year in my life. And, yeah. you know, it was, if you walk, if you went out into the countryside, it was very hard to understand what anybody was talking about. In the cities, of course, they were more gentrified. And of course, they had, they had fluent English, but they certainly had their drawls. And there were many, many unique drawls. And I really loved New Orleans because of the vast cultural differences among the community level members there. So I I don't know, I just really love what you're talking about. <laughs> you know? So how did you get into doing linguistics? I was so fascinated by the structure of the language. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm the only one. I've noticed it in people who, who really began study, studying Algonquian languages. Mm -hmm. that, uh, it is so fascinating. It is very elegant and sophisticated mm -hmm. and complex, and it can have laser-like precision in describing things. And give us a sample. Was, can you just give us a sample of a word that you feel like that about? Because I love your words of the day when you're where you're identifying animals or moons or, or you know, natural events. This will probably be my first TikTok. I just opened an account today. My wife is insisting that I do it. So I would, in fact, I'm drinking it right now. One You're that drinking? I would love is uh, Makade Mashkiki Wabu. Makade Mashkiki Wabu. Black medicine liquid. Coffee. <laughs> uh, and even in that word, you have Makade, which is, which is black. That's an old, old word. That is literally... Did the natives have coffee? No, this is an innovation. So they're describing. Okay. Yeah, I see. I see. They're describing it. Uh, so Makade, which again, that is, that's probably. Um, I think we could make a case that a word like that could go back to the prior to the ending of the last ice age. Wow! Like so, oh. all of a sudden, you're using a sound that has been used over and over and over for millennia upon millennia. Yeah. Uh, Mushkiki. It's our word for medicine in Ojibwe. Now, it, it, it's a very beautiful term because even in this small word, uh, you have mashkawazi, which means strength, and the key is from the earth. Hmm. The description of medicine in Ojibwe, it's literally the strength of the earth. Hmm. And the abu, that's a liquid of some kind. So when you put it all together, you have black medicine liquid. 
coffee. Oh, yeah. ah. Now, some people will even simplify it and just say coffee. But when you hear people describe it, I'm like, ah, oh, that is that is very beautiful. What I wanted to know is what those little word parts meant. Yeah, yeah. And the only way at the time to do that was uh, was through linguistics. So it wasn't as much to be a linguist as it was to be able to understand what uh, linguistic scholars were writing about the language. And as an instructor and as a teacher, hopefully be able to translate that technical jargon to the community in a way that is uh, more readily available to them. Hmm. Uh, so that was that was my goal with it. And it, it also gave me a chance to work with the language on a daily basis, which was the goal. Yeah. It's important for me to note that my goal wasn't to be a teacher as much as it was to teach Ojibwe. Wow. That's, that's what I wanted to do. Because I've met a number of educators who are really brilliant, who are, who, who are teachers. But my goal was to teach Ojibwe. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so that was what led me to linguistics. You know, I've traveled about our country an awful lot in my life. So I've, I've dealt with the Hopi. I've dealt with the, um, now every name is going to leave my mind. I'm sorry. I'm too old. I, I, I come from Wisconsin where we had Chief Blackhawk in my neighborhood. He came up the, the Mississippi and over on the Rock River. The Rock River went by through my backyard. And we had a little camp across. This is why I love them so much is because I've always been hearing stories about the Indians who lived there. I was raised in a little town. I was born in Madison, 35 miles away. But I was raised in Fort Atkinson, which was a fort, a stockade where General Henry Atkinson was at war with Chief Blackhawk. But Chief Blackhawk wasn't a tribal chief. He was a warrior chief. And during our uh, French, I don't know when, I, I, this is, I I don't even know how this relates to the revolution in timing necessarily, but President Andrew Johnson wanted to meet Chief Blackhawk. And so he was taken to Washington, D.C. to meet with the president. And the president was very impressed with him but and gave him a carriage to drive him back home. I mean, he held him in a jail in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I believe he was a POW, a prisoner yeah. of war. He was. I mean, he was uh, and I can't uh, even imagine a native <laughs> in a jail. But he impressed the president so much that the president gave him a carriage and a driver to take him back home. And then the legend had it. Because I read Blackhawk's autobiography, which surprised me because I didn't know that he knew how to write, but he could have dictated it. But um, he, uh, the, this car caravan that he was returning to his native lands in Wisconsin, Illinois area on the east side of the Mississippi, he was um, kind of like uh, a riot came upon him in when he was in, I think, either Albany or Buffalo, and they killed the driver. But then he, and I, I don't know if they were going to hang him or what, but somehow he got his way out of it and then got a new driver and he returned. But by that time, of course, the white people had taken all of their land. And I come from this area where we had mounds, like a hundred foot wingspan. And we also had intaglios. I mean, there was a tribe there that dug intaglios that were just as elegant as the mounds. And I know that that's a very rare site in archeological history. And now about 15 years ago, maybe, we finally got archeologists into my hometown and they're trying to, because this was a great gathering area. Blackhawk was actually a Sauk Indian, which is from the northern part of Wisconsin. And then there were many other, I don't know how to divide the nations, how you divide the nations between tribes, nations, and whatever else you do it. But it was it was where they came to commingle, and they would share their goods. And, and in the summertime, they would have great parties. So that's why you had all these mounds and these intaglios there. And of course, white people just, you know, plowed them out. But um, you can... At least you can still see them in many, many locations. Also on the Mississippi River, we had Aztalan, which was actually formed by the Aztec Indians who came up the Mississippi River. So this has all been part of me in my life. And I remember going to our little old house when I was maybe eight or nine years old, and we were given a tour and they were talking about how we established this hometown here. 
And I said, yeah, but I want to see the Indian stuff. And this woman who was in charge looked at me, she said, we beat them. Why would we show them? And I just cried all the way. I just cried because in my imagination as a child, I just so idealized, but I had no access to anything. I didn't even watch we didn't have TV until I was maybe five or six, but I, I wasn't, I've never been a big TV watcher. So I don't really watch Westerns. I have watched Westerns in my life, but your, your history and your, yeah, these cultures are so rich with information about how to live on the earth, constantly giving back to the earth, revering the earth, I'm so glad that we can actually talk today and, and hear from you. Miigwech. Yeah. yeah Aslan is a, is a fascinating place. Uh, and you I don't, don't know it, that it was Aztecs, maybe uh -huh. technology from Mesoamerica is yeah. my guess, traveled up the Mississippi yeah. Yeah. to the Mississippian cultures, which is actually an Ojibwe word. To share <laughs> over viewers. It comes from Missy. Mississippi. Oh, I love it. Giant. Or yeah. big, yeah. and ZB oh. river. It's the big river. Love it. It's kind of it's a newer word because from the Ojibwe perspective and Algonquian speaking people's perspective, it wasn't one river; it was a network of rivers. Yeah, that right. are all interconnected. And yeah. since we're talking about Blackhawk, they are a sister language to Ojibwe. Mm. So it would be maybe comparable to French and Spanish mm -hmm. or Spanish mm -hmm. and Italian. Like if mm -hmm. I look at Black Hawk's name, and mm -hmm. I've actually just used two of these words. You have Makade, which is black. Mishi, which is big. And Gake Gake, Makade Mishi Gake Gake, which uh, was Black Hawk's name in his language. Oh, wow. So that Missy and Mishi, Mishi. Uh, yeah. These are, are are related to one another. Yeah. So the idea is that Meskwaki, Sac, uh, the Fox language, uh, Meskwaki, Kekapu, Ojibwe, Shawnee, which comes from uh, Shawan in any, the mm -hmm. Southerners, were probably at one point during the creation of these mountains, one tribe, hmm. one group of uh, we call the proto-Algonquian speaking, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that as they separate, as they uh, grow and move to different areas, will begin speaking a yeah. similar language, but one that will change the way that yeah. in Latin, yeah, like uh, yeah, it, Latin will become French, Portuguese, Italian, Spanish. Spanish. Yeah. And so something similar will happen here. So I have a great deal of respect for the people who, who built those magnificent mounds. Um, me too. Well as, uh, where they buried yeah. their ancestors too, is to, yeah. you know, to point this out to people who may be listening. A uh, mm -hmm. number of these are, are grave sites. Mm -hmm. are places where ancestors have been buried that you could return to. And, you know, once you've been there, you see they're clearly marked. They're very big. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this would... What a wonderful place to be with uh, the people who created you, yeah. the people who you are inextricably yeah. interconnected to. That's yeah. our Ojibwe word for my great grandparent, but it's also our word for ancestor. It has in it onik, to be linked, to be interconnected. Jeez, oh, I step back. You can imagine <laughs> like a uh, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a chain link. Yeah, and then. Uh, that B would be thread-like. So it's someone who I am inextricably interconnected to. Yeah. It's someone I'm linked to. Yeah. And that uh, their experience that's going to affect your experience. Yeah. Wow. So, so to have that kind of, of respect for those people and uh, yeah. as well as, as for the land, as mm -hmm. for the environment, mm -hmm. that you're really not different from it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that you absolutely needed to survive. So. Wow. So you have a you you are a linguist today, and and do you have a business name? Kind of a linguist. Uh, I'm not. I'm by no means a, a pen and pencil and paper linguist any longer. I've become more of a, a speaker, 
mm-hmm. and and an educator. Um, but the linguistics certainly informs that because it played such a huge role in my life for a number of years. Yeah. Uh, And again, it's so, yeah, the things I speak about, which has been so nice because with social media, Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm not bound to Mm -hmm. some of the things that I may lack passion about. And, uh, (laughs) Like yeah. what? Like what? What? I mean, I'm I'm trying to understand what you mean by some things that you don't like that you lack passion for. What uh, you- for example, as as a in linguistics, I would not want to teach a, a minimalist grammar I see. approach yeah. to Algonquian languages. Yeah. That, and that would be, you know, in syntax, mm-hmm. that would be a a very important class that you would absolutely need to take yeah. and uh, yeah. to teach phonology. Mm-hmm to, uh, you know, and the the theory and approaches to it, which can be, you know, which are very scientific. This is linguistics. It is the scientific study of language. I know. Yeah. Uh, so that I can uh, maybe take a, an approach that can, that's more, not digestible, but more approachable to a larger group of people who may be fascinated by it by the language like me absolutely yes. absolutely absolutely so yeah to talk about like the name uh uh-huh. black hawk or the history of you know the word for the mississippi the mrs Missis- mrs uh, i know milwaukee came from a native language came from milwaukee language. Yeah, because you mentioned it. And um, we have many, many towns around. And as I've traveled the country, you know, I've I've been in almost every single state driving. And this was in like the the 70s, especially. I traveled across our country then and and since then. So I've traveled across the country maybe 25 times. I mean, all the way. And I, I, I hate the freeway. So I would, we would always get off with my first husband. We'd get off. We'd always find a local barbecue or something like that. But I was always so curious about the people and the natives that came from that area. So I've, I've traveled through all different kinds of tribal lands. I've been a, I was a board member for a short time here with an Indian museum, which had a big map on the wall, which showed all of the original nations. Awesome. And, what nation do you mind my asking? I'm sorry. What nation were you working with? In this Indian museum? Yes. I I don't really even know. They were showing, they showed Indian, they had exhibits from around our whole country. So they had Pueblos, they had, uh, why can't I think of any other Indian names? I mean, there were all the Indian names. And I've met, I met another native. His name was, um, sorry, I can't remember it now, but I met him when I first moved to San Bernardino in 1972. And he came from Montreal area and he left Southern California to come back to Montreal when the nations were going through that. When I think the Quebec thing that happened in the nineties, did you say? I think he, he wanted to, there was something that was going on in Montreal with the natives or with the first Canadians. And he really wanted to be a part of that. And my girlfriend who was, came from Denmark was his girlfriend and uh, she moved there with him and then they married and they had a, a son and I've seen her two years ago for the first time since they left San Bernardino in like 1973 or four. So I, I, um, I don't know what I was talking about really, but, but you know, it's just that I, I feel like it was oh, this map, it was this map yeah. about all the, all the tribes and everything that was really what amazing because you have Algonquins and then Iroquois. And is that another whole the language family yes yeah and then the hopi of course and then the what was right by the hopi um the uh maybe uto aztecan i mean i know i've heard of them but i can't and the uh, athabascan Diné athabascan the navajo the navajo that's what i was trying to think of thank you yes and then in san Bernardino, we had indians uh we yes. had natives and um but they were very much not talked about. We had a lot, we had a very big, you know, Hispanic culture. Of course, California was established by the Spaniards, which came here and they gave us all of their aspects. 
and then we had the Mormons in, you know, so people do move around and I, you know, I'm very familiar with how they change their language whenever they land in a new place because there are new, new things around and new, and you've got different people that you're meeting and things like that. I just find it's it. by the Northeastern aspect because we have a number of sister nations there too, or uh, <laughs> nations who speak a sister language to us, Eastern Algonquian. So uh -huh. uh, Mi'kmaq. Yep. Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, uh, uh, Ab, uh, Ab, Ab, uh, there's something, Ab, I can't. Abenaki. 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 Is it Abenaki or is it Abenaki? Because I've heard it spoken both heard ways. By me. As an Ojibwe speaker, we would say Waban Aki. Ah. And that means Waban is, uh -huh. uh, it, it's uh, again, very beautifully descriptive. Waban is the dawn. Uh -huh. It's a it's a complete sentence on its own. Hmm. Uh, capital W period at the end. Waban. It is dawn. Wow. Where does the dawn take place? In the east. In the east. Wabanong. That's our word for east. Ah. From whence the dawn comes. And then when you put a key at the end of it, you have Wabanaki, the eastern lands, the land of dawn, the ah. eastern lands. And so that whole confederation we referred to as a. Uh, Waban Aki. So I think the nation was set up with that name, but from their perspective, it was all of the peoples who lived there in the Confederacy. Yeah. yeah. Themselves. Well, we describe them as Waban Aki. So how do you break down? Do you have like nations? And then after that, do you have tribes? Or how do you break up the kind of like I mean, here we have states, we have counties, we have community, we have villages, we have cities. Yeah. How do you break down your world? There is, uh, we have the, the nation, the people themselves. Uh, they may, you know, and this is a very Western perspective of it. We like the nation state. Yeah. So you can have a nation of people who may or may not have a land base. For here in the United States, you have... Uh, if we're talking about our nation to nation relationship, which it is indeed, uh, when you talk about the treaties, which are the supreme law of the land, mm -hmm. if you look at the constitution, that's mm -hmm. what they're listed as. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the nation, the people themselves, the people who, who use the language, the people who are related. Mm -hmm. Some people may be adopted in a nation uh, has that right to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then you also have a, a land base, which would be the reservations. So um, I'm talking about before different. we had reservations, you know, please. I mean, this map was so, I mean, I, I could just stand in front of that map for hours and hours. Isn't it fascinating? Yeah. Where as a linguist, I like to look at the language families because <laughs> it kind of gives you a big, broad picture. And then as you look closer to it, you you get an understanding of ah who were their relatives yeah. who did they sp understand one another when they spoke to one another did they hear words that they recognized and said at one point i recognize you as as a relative mm -hmm. um, so yeah. it is it is absolutely it is absolutely fascinating and so much uh some of it's lost I in know. the east coast for example yeah uh some of the most fascinating research in the past 20 years. Uh, I believe it was off of Cape Cod. There was mm -hmm. a linguist who figured out that it wasn't one nation. There were four different languages that were spoken in a small area. Like Cape Cod? That were living next to each other, that mm -hmm. they were related, but they were unique languages. Yeah. That is wow. an incredible amount of diversity. Yeah. And that people will, you know, uh, not even will no, have no yeah. idea about you'll yeah. think of. And Other today, things. of course, we're so distracted that we've, we're, we're losing every all kinds of history. We're just losing all kinds of history, good and bad. I mean, I'm always glad to see the bad history go. But I just, you know, I feel knowing our history, I always was learning history with every trip I ever took anywhere. Even when I was an art director and I was covering seven Western states out of LA, I would still go and find about the, out about the history of that state or that particular area that I was in. And 
because for Look. me that helps me ground myself because I, I obviously I come from uh, British Isles. My father was Welsh Irish. My mother was part of the Puritans. So, and I've, I've always, I've often been embarrassed by that, but I also know that the, if you live on those islands, you want to get away from them. And, you know, they're very wet in, in the winter and I mean, they're gorgeous, but they're also real, real difficulties there. And, and it's just kind of natural that Great Britain kind of consumed the, the whole world. But I still feel that those who did travel and found out about the history of the area that they ended up in did a lot better in terms of making friends or servicing the people if they felt like that, that's what they had to do. And, but, you know, it, it, even linguistically speaking, there's a, you know, if you look at the, uh, the British Isles, Mm -hmm. you you get a whole bunch of history when you look at the Celtic languages. Yeah, uh, yeah. You get Welsh, yeah. which is absolutely unlike English. When you look at Cornish, when you look at uh, yeah. Scots and Irish Gaelic. Yes. And yeah. how these, you know, yeah. the languages there are telling a story too about history. Yeah, that's right. And uh, so I'm fascinated by that all over the world. Me too. I, I mean, I, I took French in seventh grade and in college I took uh, Italian literature. So I, I mean, I learned the Italian language but I wasn't exactly speaking it. Then I went to Italy and all I could remember was my pidgin French. And then, but as an exchange student, when I was sent to Istanbul at age 16 as an exchange student, that was such a different world. And it, it just, it, I mean, it literally blew me right out of my hometown and my high school and everything. But what I found so fascinating was that Istanbul is the, is the crossroads of the globe. And you have everybody there, literally every race, creed, religious background, everything. And it just amazed me how, because I had never seen any other races being raised in this little town in Wisconsin. I mean, we had one mulatto couple and she happened to be our librarian. And he, her husband was a philosopher farmer. And they were just the most fascinating people to me. My sister and I both took her on as our, our surrogate mother because she was just such a vibrant personality. And, but yet, you know, when you, I, I'm sorry, I'm losing track of what I'm talking about. And I don't want to keep on talking because I want to let you talk. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, it's... Uh... No, I'd love to. I had a chance to visit Kushadeshi, Kushadeshi, in in Turkey, and it was it was a lovely ah. visit. But yeah, there is a no. There is a great deal of of history, of yes. stories that are that you are able to tell through through the language. Yeah, uh, every language. Where every you find language. that these languages are spoken. Yeah. So for yeah. me to be really totally informed uh, about a, a culture that I wasn't raised with, mm -hmm. about um, a, a spiritual perspective, about uh, a cultural perspective, about a linguistic perspective, a mental perspective as well. I think yeah. some of the most... Uh, it's emotional too. It's an emotional perspective. And for, it's also, yeah, it, it resonates, it, it, for me, it resonates with like, me at, at the atomic level. And I know that I, I do believe in, in multiple lives. And I know that in past lives, I've been Japanese. I have been in Europe. I was part of the, um, the purge of the Jews because I was a Jewess raised in France. And then I died in one of the camps. So I have, I guess, in, in my genetic makeup or my my spiritual background or my atomic, I don't care how you want to call it, that I can relate. And I really enjoy having conversations like this with you because this is what I think we all need to know today before we get so busy with our damn computers and our cell phones. If we could just 
learn more about where each of us comes from, how we can get along, how we can, how we all are related and we all need each other. This is why my business is online because it's not that I, I, I can't, I don't have a local business. I do have local business, but I don't actually spend a lot of time on it. I'm a board member at, a health, at a, our, our health service here. That's a very active job for me. I really love that job. I am very active with the native populations. There are many, many powwows that go around here and I'm always a sucker for a good powwow. But I, I had to get over even my own self-consciousness going to a powwow. And then, but I do this because I'm so curious about people. And, and your curiosity is just like the hallmark for me. So I salute you in all of your passions, James, because Rich. you have provided me so much information because I know that a lot of America is built around Native cultures and we have a lot of Native words that are used not all over the place, but every region has their own Native languages and all of that stuff. Yeah, if you look so, at a number of states, how many of them there are Wisconsin, You know, that name, that's that's an Indian name, you know. Um, yeah, really. Yeah. Illinois, and there, there are so many of them. So yeah. to to acknowledge that, yeah, this is indigenous land. Yes. Indigenous people. It is. Lived here from time immemorial. Yes. Millennia upon oh. millennia. Yeah, it's, Our it's time is running out. I'm so sorry. So let me just ask you my final question. For what are you most grateful for today? Uh, you know what? Every night I'll, I'll offer tobacco. And I'll ask not just for myself, but for all of our relatives to, that we have peace and well-being. Yeah. To have good health. Yeah. That our thoughts and our emotions are in balance so that we may know joy. And, and to walk along the path of life in a good way. And... Uh, yeah, at this very moment, I, I feel that. I'll ask for that again this evening. And it is indeed a good day. Minogishigat. It has been uh, bone cracking cold here in Minnesota. 28 below, you said. 28 <laughs> below. And then yesterday was 36 below. And right now it is a balmy 28 degrees. <laughs> yeah. It is warm enough to snow. And it is a beautiful day. So I am grateful to, to see this beautiful day. Thank you so much, Jim, for just for this whole hour. It's just been a delight talking with you. Thank you, Speak Up and Empower, for allowing us to do this. Please come and visit me at Trauma's Peace, which is a private group on Facebook. All you have to do is friend my profile page. I also have Survivor's Grace at, in a Traumatic World, which you can go, if you can stand to scroll and scroll, I have posted maybe 300 videos uh, and articles about trauma that will help you. Thank you so much, Jim. Goodbye, everybody. Have a good week.